What's going on fam and welcome back to my channel. First off, let me start by saying I am so thankful to everybody who was so supportive after I told my story about leaving my position as a New York City school psychologist. Um, it was a quick decision. It was kind of difficult. It was very emotional. Um, but I can say it's been almost a year and I'm, I am not regretting it at all. So today, I really wanted to focus on the five things that I do miss about working in a school and the five things that I don't miss about working in a school. Because I still do consider myself to be a school psychologist at heart, and I do use a lot of the skills and strategies and techniques that I used when I worked in an actual school building in the things that I do now. So if you are curious about what I'm doing now, I do work in private practice primarily as a psychotherapist, but I also incorporate parent coaching and training. I also incorporate some advocacy. I definitely incorporate behavior management and behavior strategies, as well as academic intervention and skill building. So I definitely bring my school psychologist hat to the job with me, even though I'm not working in a school building anymore. I digress, today is not about that. The five things that I do miss about working in a school and the five things that I don't miss about working in a school. So number one, the thing that I miss probably the most about being a school psychologist working for the city is that check. I ain't even gonna lie. It was very comforting to know that my paycheck was going to look the exact same every single week, regardless of the amount of effort that I put in for the week, regardless of you know, whether I was feeling it, I did my job, make no mistake, but there are times when maybe you're a little more low energy, you know, so some days you really just do show up. I just showed up so I didn't get fined, you know what I'm saying? Um, so it was a comfort to not really have to worry about benefits and insurance and things like that. Uh, so that's probably, it's, it's that secure feeling. But listen, I'm here, the lights are on, you know, like I said, it's pretty. It's still pretty cold out here. Spring is kind of peeking around the corner, but it's still pretty cold. The lights are on, the heat is on. I'm clearly not suffering uh, for food, you know, so the bills are getting paid, but it's definitely more of a hustle and it's something that I have to be more conscious and on top of versus being a salaried employee for the city. The next thing that I miss is having a group of colleagues that I can consult with on a daily basis. So when you're a school psychologist, you work with a team. They call it a multidisciplinary team and you usually have a social worker who works with you. You usually have a clerical worker in the DOE, the New York City Department of Education. We call them family workers or family associates. Um, you know, and then you, you just have other people around you. You have related service providers, you have speech providers, OTs, you have the guidance counselors, and you have the teachers, you know? So I definitely miss being a part of kind of an instant community. Like you walk into a school and it's definitely like a micro eco ecosystem. It, it definitely has its own ecosystem. And I do kind of miss walking into somebody's office and saying, hey, how you doing? And we can do anything. We can shoot the breeze and work on a case together. We can vent together. Just be cool, you know? So I definitely miss that instant community of being a part of a school. I definitely, definitely, definitely miss my kids. I miss my kids so much. I miss being able to walk down a hallway and at the time I was Miss Barnes, I'm Dr. Barnes now, but at the time when I first started working in schools, I was Miss Barnes and I had such a great rapport with the kids. And in any school that I worked in, I felt like I always was able to connect with the kids, which is why I got into this field in the first place, you know? So I definitely, definitely, definitely miss seeing those fresh faces, just passing by, walking down the hall. They got to know me. I was a safe space in the school, so they would come to me, you know, when they needed to talk or just hide out or whatever. I got to be like the cool staff in the building. And, um, you know, so I miss them. I miss my families. I miss the parents. I love the feeling that I get when I explain to a parent why their child is not performing at the same rate as their peers and the parent gets it. And then I love being able to 
give them strategies and let them know this is not the end of it. This is where they shine. This is where they're really struggling and they need some additional support, but we're going to work it out. These are the steps we're going to take to work it out. And nine times out of 10, we were always on the same page. I loved encouraging and empowering parents. One of my favorite sayings is you are the expert on your kid. We're the expert in the school and education system, but you're the expert on your kid. You know your kid better than anybody here. You know, there are a lot of people, and I'm gonna make this point. There are a lot of people working in public services who don't understand the public. And that can lead to a lot of stereotyping, a lot of biases, a lot of mistreatment because you think that they don't know better or you think that someone you know, doesn't care because they don't present it the same way that you expect. And I got to step in as an advocate so many times for people, parents in particular, who were being underestimated by the child's teacher or by the administrators of the school. And I got to let that parent know like, hey, you have a voice in this. You know, you have something to contribute. You don't come to the school and just let us tell you anything. I tell them that too. You know, you don't let us just tell you anything. Here's the research. Here are the resources. If you want to read up on it, ask your questions. Always ask questions. I always would stop the meeting. I would stop mid-sentence. You look like there's something going on, Mom. You okay? Dad, you don't look too sure. You have a question? I love that. I love being that person, you know? Um... I miss being in an office full time, um, and I'm and I'm and I'm saying that lightly because I love the idea of a hybrid schedule and it works for me. So I wouldn't um, go so far, but I miss having my office. Like I walk into the room, my name is either on the door or on the desk. My stuff is set up where it's set up. When you work in private practice. One, working in private practice, I only go in part of the week. I miss. Again, just walking through the school building and I'm headed to my office and people know where to find me. You know, I had my own filing system, you know, and I loved going through the files and especially toward the end of the year because you do do a lot of work. You do do a lot of evaluations and testing and report writing. So it, it does do something to you to be able to go through your stuff and be able to show to see all the work that you've done and have your filing system in place and have all of that stuff there. So I do kind of, I miss the feel of being in an office. I don't want to go back to that every single day, but I liked making a space mine. I used to have a big calendar on the wall and me and my family associate, we would go through the calendar and we would just, okay, this is happening here. That's happening there. And it felt like a, you know, like a boss. Yeah, I felt like a boss. Yeah. And then, like I said, just being in the school, being in the school building, walking down the hall, you know, seeing the kids work, walking past classrooms and, you know, hearing just the hustle and bustle of the kids working, walking past the lunchroom and the kids be in the lunchroom. And sometimes I would go in there and, you know, I teach them little hand games. I miss, I miss that, that feeling. You know, and, and it's a reminder of why I was there and what I was there for. You know, I loved watching the kids grow up. You know, I could see a kid that I tested three years ago and they were like seven and now they're 10 and, you know, they're maturing and they're, you know, a different version of themselves, but they still remember me. Um, you know, those, those, those things that, you know, that makes you feel... That makes you feel good. So I miss being in a school. Things I don't miss, let's talk about it. Okay, number one, I do not miss contractual hours. Not at all. I do not miss having to be somewhere at a certain time and having to stay there until a certain time, regardless of whatever work has gotten done, whatever work needs to be done. Um, on top of that, as a clinician, now here's the thing. And I don't begrudge this at all um, because psychologists do make more than teachers. Um, but then that also means you have to stay longer than teachers. And a lot of the time it's like you're only going to do so much work in a given day. 
I mean, you really are, right? Like, it takes a lot of effort. Again, a lot of the evaluations that we have to do, a lot of the reports that we have to write. It's a lot, and then it's a lot of people on the brain. You have to consult with people throughout the day. I mean, it's work. It's work. It's a job. You know what I'm saying? So there's so much that you're going to do in a given day or in a given week. So it's like if I'm tapped out at 1.30, I'm not doing anything else. I've done... And there's days when I'm like, no, I earned my paycheck today. Y'all know, y'all y'all had the, y'all have had those days. I know you have, right? Where it's like, nope, I earned my check today. I did this, 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 and this. I went through my to-do list for the day, did a couple of extra tasks. You did that, honey. You're going to take yourself a break, right? That can happen at 1.30. That can happen at 3.30. But I'm done at 1.30, and I'm stuck here for another two hours and I'm tapped out for the day, and there's other stuff that I could be doing, why am I here? Why am I here? And they, and you know, it's a city job. They take that super seriously, and I get it. I just, I just didn't want it, you know? Having to be at work by 8 a.m. every single morning, a lot of stuff you don't have to be in the building to do. Sometimes being in a school means that you get caught up in what's going on at the school, right? It's a it's a community. It's a it's a system, right? So sometimes they need you. They're pulling on you. They're calling your name. But on the other side, you have compliance dates and you have to get your paperwork done and you have to do this. So now you're stuck between either saying no, I'm not going to help or you're going to help, but then somehow you have to make up for that time. Um, that you lost by getting involved in that other thing. It's just a lot, a lot of paperwork and a lot of that stuff uh, you can do at home. So I've actually used sick days. I, I would use my sick days so that I could do my work at home. So it's like I'm taking a personal day to do work because I have to get caught up because I can't get so far behind on my compliance days because they check, and I'll, I'll talk about compliance in a little bit, you know, but they do check. They check the percentages to determine how well you're meeting your compliance dates. And if you have a certain amount of cases not done by their compliance dates, you have to answer for that. And a lot of the time, they don't care that your school had a lot of crises, had a lot of behavior crises. And, um, you know, your principal wanted to meet with you or the principal gave you lunch duty, which is illegal. And this did happen to me. But the principal gave me lunch duty for like two months. Legally, that is not allowed, <laughs> but she gave me lunch duty, you know, um, they don't care about that. They want your numbers, you know, and that's a great segue into the next thing I don't really miss, which are the caseload requirements. I just, so when you work in a school, when you work for the Department of Education, you are expected to complete about 100 cases a year, give or take. You might complete a little more, you might complete a little less, depending on where you are and you are assigned by cluster. So your cluster can have just one school or it can have up to five schools or maybe even more, right? Um, but the cluster is determined by how many cases you're expected to get done at a certain school within the year. So for every 20 cases, that determines how many days you'll be assigned to a particular building. So. If the school is big enough that I'm likely to get all 100 cases, which essentially roughs out to 20 cases per five day week, 20 times five would equal to 100 cases per year, then I'm gonna be based at one school for the, for the whole year. I'm not gonna have another school that I'll have to go to. If say one school is not that large or doesn't have that high a referral rate, let's say they think you'll only complete maybe 60 cases that year, then you'll be at that school for three days a week and then you'll be at another school or a couple of other schools the rest of the two days in that week. You can end up in a cluster of five different one day schools. So you're going to a different school every single day. So depending on the cluster that you're assigned to, either way, it's still a large caseload. It's a heavy caseload. And the more teams and administrators that you have to work with, the more you have to juggle. You're constantly explaining your job and your role to people because for whatever reason, they just... And I get it. Being a school psychologist, it is a very involved position and it is hard to describe to everyone all the details and nuances that go into your job, but it does get tiring 
re-explaining yourself over and over and over again when a lot of it is stuff that you can look up. You can look up special education law, especially federal law. You can look up the chancellor's regulations. It really shouldn't be on one person to always have to educate people on what they do and why they're there. Like, let me do my job, please, you know? And again, your compliance states. You're having a hard time if somebody's not cooperating with your process. And usually, I will be fair, usually if you have a good explanation as to why your compliance, you know, why you're not meeting your compliance state, they don't really bother you that much. But then there are situations where it's like, you know from jump that this is going to take a very long time. The compliance state does not move based on the complexity of the case you're just out of compliance. That goes into your compliance percentage and it also goes into the school's compliance percentage, which means that the principal is impacted by it and the principal doesn't really care. It always comes back to administration. I'm telling you, administration can make or break a school. No lies. Um, but they don't really care why. You know, so you're... You're reporting to your clinical supervisor who's outside the building and you're reporting to your building supervisor who's usually the principal. Um, and a lot of the time they're not on accord and you're kind of stuck in the middle and you're playing a politics game and you're just trying to do your job. So that is definitely one of the things that I really had a hard time with um, in general. I just didn't like it. Professional development. So on professional development days, professional development days are typically designed, so they're designed for school staff and they have gotten a little bit better by breaking things up. You just had to attend school-wide professional development. Now they've started breaking it up by your discipline. So on professional development days, school psychologists go and meet with other school psychologists in the district. Um, but it used to be you had to sit in on the teacher's professional developments. And it always sucks because they never ever would touch on things that were relevant to school psychologists or social workers. So you're just sitting there and you got a mountain of work to do, right? Because you could be getting a jump start on meeting your compliance dates and you're just sitting there not caring about what they're talking about. And even with the school psychologist PDs, a lot of it is very redundant. A lot of it is like, you know, they'll they'll tell us what our responsibilities are as school psychologists, but you know when you're working in a building and you're not in charge of that building, there's so much that you can do to meet some of those uh, requirements and standards. So case in point, creating a behavior plan. So I know that when a teacher can implement certain behavior strategies and progress monitor and document what they're doing, I know that we can see a decline in the behavior we don't wanna see and we can see an increase in the behavior that we're looking for. Keeping in mind that teachers are overworked and undersupported just as much as more so, I'll, I'll even say more so than we are, the largest class size in the New York City school classroom is 32 students with one teacher. 32 students to one teacher. 32 to one. So I understand that the teacher realistically can't make that happen but you're getting on me to make the recommendation anyway. And it's just like, it's like a broken system. And then when it doesn't get monitored, the progress doesn't get monitored, it comes back to us. You're supposed to do this, 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 and this. And everybody's sitting there like, yes, we know, but, okay. So it's just like a big waste of time. And I'm like, if you turn it into a paperwork day, Teachers get paperwork days. We don't, technically, every day for us is a paperwork day, but it's like, give us an actual paperwork day where nobody can bother us, nobody can talk to us, like, let us get all of our reports done without interruptions, without, you know, you know, and I would, I would have to designate my own paperwork days, but those days would be perfect paperwork days because there's nothing else to do but finish up your reports. So let those be our official paperwork days. You know, so I really hated um, professional developments, irrelevant meetings. Everybody's seen that meme, you know, when the meeting should have been an email. We got those too. So I don't miss that. I don't have to deal with that at all. Working in private practice, you know, that feels good. And then finally, 
chain of command. It always, always, always goes back to chain of command. You almost can't do anything without CCing somebody on an email. And granted, it saves you. You know, like I said in my last video, um, it got to a point where I didn't go anywhere without having something to write with and something to write on. I would often have to follow up with um, a clarifying email to make sure that everybody is on the same page and I had it written, you know? So it saves you, but I hate that, I hated that you had to operate that way. That really, ugh, it's so annoying. Even to go to my PDs, even to go to school psychologist PDs, I would have to ask the principal permission to attend a mandatory School psychologist professional development. Make that make sense, please. I have to, I'm mandated to go. I get in trouble if I don't go. But if I ask my principal and she says no, which I had a principal who literally fought me every time I wanted to go to a professional development. So I eventually stopped asking because it, it became so toxic. Then I had to deal with my supervisor, my clinical supervisor, because I wasn't coming to PDs anymore. I'm like, that is a y'all problem. It's a y'all problem that you're making a me problem. Make it make sense. And then you got to go, you know, to over, you, you know, you got to go over people's heads and you have to report things. It's just like, I, ugh. Again, I just wanted to come in here and do my job, mind my business, and go home. Can can we all, can we all get on that page? You know what I'm saying? Like, I ugh, hated it. So, um, yeah, that's that's definitely something that I absolutely do not miss. I technically, I have a supervisor that I technically report to, but. Not really, and that's just really because she's over the practice that I work for. So she's really just like, hey, do your progress notes, you're good. Like, <laughs> I don't really have to worry about that. And then once I finish my licensing exam, it's even more, you know, freedom and autonomy. So that's where I'm at. Um, as far as leaving, the pros are still heavily outweighing the cons. Yeah, I miss I miss being around people on a more regular basis, but... I also know that there's other ways to make that happen. I wouldn't even mind going back into a school building as a contracted uh, psychologist, you know, and that would give me kind of the best of both worlds. You know, it's on the table, but I definitely don't miss, I still don't miss being a school psych who's been hired by a district uh, working in a building where 15 million people are in charge of me um, and I have to try to make those 15 million people happy and still somehow maintain my own peace of mind. I don't miss that at all. So, you know, if you have questions or more comments or again, I really, I'm very interested in you guys' stories. I've been, again, I've been talking to a lot of colleagues. I've been listening to a lot of different people who have had very similar experiences. I do believe that revelation and revolution is coming to the education system um many many people are leaving and finding fulfillment and bringing their skills as educators into whatever other paths they've chosen to take um so i do think we're going to start seeing a lot of changes i don't know when it's going to happen how it's going to happen but the more we talk the more we expose the more we you know put things out there i think the closer we'll get to change so thank y'all for joining me. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Don't forget to check out my new podcast with my cousin every second Sunday. We're talking about generational trauma. We're talking about family cycles. We're talking about ways that relationships are impacted by how we're raised by our families. It's great conversation. I think you'll really enjoy it. Thanks again. Y'all have a great one. Love you. Bye.